much. And good morning, New Life Community Church. And Merry Christmas. I'm going to say that as much as I can while I still can. Today is the second week in our Advent series. We're talking about what these candles up here represent. There's a reason we light each one of them to help us remember something. Last week, Tanya spoke about how that first candle represents hope. The second one today is supposed to remind us of peace, something that can be very hard to find and often out of reach. How can one find peace in today's world? Is really what our hearts are feeling most of the time. And today, I want to seek to answer that question. I'm going to start by reading, I think, one of the most Christmassy passages in the entire Bible, and it's one of my favorites. It's in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8. You even quoted some of it during worship. I think Joanne had mentioned one of these verses. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version, just because I like the way that one reads. But if you want to follow along in your NIV Bible, Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And that's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. <laughs> if you've seen it, you get the reference. When Joanne mentioned this verse before, the NIV quotes it, I think, closer to the original language. See, this verse was written in Greek. That's what the New Testament is written in. So in the original language, the words are closer to this meaning, peace to those on whom God's favor rests. This peace can be available to everyone. It is good news for everyone, but only those who are willing to receive this peace will actually be able to benefit from it. So why is the coming of Christ on earth signaling some change? There is a shift where now there will be more peace available than there was before. Because we know the rest of history, up until this point anyway, after Jesus was born, wars and violence and death and disease and persecution all still continued. You know, the angels were speaking this to, to shepherds that were living under the citizenship of the Roman Empire, where this tyrannical government could arrest your friends and family members, put them to death, take all their money, and basically do anything they want at any given moment. How do you live in peace in a society like that? And even though we live in a country with far more freedoms nowadays, how do we live in peace when there is so much chaos and violence and difficulty around us? How does the birth of Jesus bring more peace into our lives? We are definitely not the only people who have struggled with this. In the 1860s, there was a poet named Henry Wadsworth Longfellow who struggled with the same difficulty between the belief in the God of peace and then the struggle with the, wor with, the, with the world and the way it is. Many of you may have heard the song, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. You know that song, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day? Do you know that that song was originally not a song? It was a poem. And it was a poem written by this guy, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And you can read about this online for yourself, but it says that in 1861, two years before he wrote this poet, this poem, Longfellow's personal peace was shaken when his second wife of 18 years, to whom he was very devoted, was fatally burned in an accidental fire. So his wife died in a fire two years before writing this song. And then that wasn't even the end of his troubles. Then in 1863, during the American Civil War, Longfellow's oldest son, Charles, joined the Union Army without his father's blessing. Later that year, his son was severely wounded in the Battle of Mine Run, and Charles eventually recovered, but his time as a soldier was finished. So imagine this. Your wife died two years ago. Your son just became a wounded veteran, and you're watching your entire country embroiled in a civil war. Those of you who know about the Civil War, the North fighting the South, brother versus brother in some cases, family member against family member, some of the worst bloodshed in American history. And he wrote this song 
or this poem at the time, On Christmas Day. So 1863, later that year that his son was wounded, two years after his wife has died, he writes this song, On Christmas Day. And it was first published in a magazine called Our Young Folks that was in circulation at that time. If you read the entire poem, you'll see references to the Civil War. It's very clear that that's the time he was writing it. And the refrain in the song is from that verse we just read in Luke, peace on earth, goodwill to men. So I want to read some of the lines from that poem, which you can now hear on the radio sometimes as a song. Many of you know it. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and mild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. So he's sitting there on Christmas Day. He steps outside, and back then there were far more old-fashioned church bells Just ding, ding, ding. He would hear all the steeples ringing for Christmas when people were getting out of service. And the bells, very much like this candle and all the decorations we have, are supposed to be a reminder, a reminder of what we're celebrating. So he heard the bells, and he was reminded of what Christmas celebrates. And he started to think, how can I celebrate this now? Without even thinking about his wife that died two years ago, he looked around at the violence, at the death, at his son's injury, at all the hatred and chaos in the United States at that time, a time when the United States was far from united. Very much the same way that we look around at the violence in Ukraine, the violence in Gaza and in Israel, and the violence even in our own country. We read in the news about shootings, about murders, about crime. We read about all this death and destruction And after looking around at that and thinking about it, he says, In despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth and goodwill to men. It's like all the hatred that I see flies in the face of the peace that we're supposed to be celebrating. Where is there peace in any of this? But then his heart comes around. He focuses his attention back on God and he remembers the point. He remembers the truth. The song doesn't end there. And he says, Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, and the right will prevail with peace on earth and goodwill to men. And that's how it comes comes around. Even though there's so much pain in the world, God's not dead. He's not sleeping on the job. He's still in control of everything. And in his power, he is still injecting peace. He is still working all things together for good. So we need to uncover this mystery today of how we can find peace in the chaos. The Christmas season alone is chaotic enough. You know, not not anything that's a matter of life and death, but it feels like it sometimes when the in-laws are coming over and you're nowhere near ready and you need to clean the house and do the shopping and all of this. It's like Tom said before, we get so hung up on everything we need to do to get ready for Christmas. Where is there peace in all of that? Well, I need to show you today that peace, it doesn't come from the outside. It can't, because that will never work. Peace has to come from the inside. It's an inner thing. And you hear people talk about inner peace and peace of mind. It's something that that we're always chasing. But I think God makes it a lot easier to access than people think. Peace cannot just come from circumstances. My mom sent me a meme recently that said, adulthood is just saying, but after this week, things will slow down over and over again until eventually you die. <laughs> you ever feel that way? You just, you want things to calm down and be less chaotic, but when that happens, it's maybe a week or a day or two at a time, and it doesn't last. So if we're waiting on things to slow down for us to get our peace in our life, we're going to be waiting a long time, probably the rest of our lives. So the peace that God gives us, it comes through believing in him. And I want you to see that. We celebrate the birth of Jesus, but what's important to us is not just that that baby was born, but that that baby grew up and said these amazing things and eventually died for our sins and rose again and showed us the way to heaven. But right before he made that ultimate sacrifice, this is what he said. And I'm going to have these verses up on the screen. These are from John chapter 14. This is no longer the baby or the child Jesus, but the man Jesus, speaking to his disciples as he knows he's about to go to the cross. And he says in John chapter 14, starting in verse 24, anyone who does not love me will not obey my teachings. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. This is important. Anyone who does not love me 
will not obey my teachings. If you do love me, the opposite side is you will obey my teachings. There's that verse that says God works all things together for good. He does, but you can only receive that if you love him. It says God works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. If you don't love God, you can't get in on this. And how do you know whether or not you love God? Well, if you love him, you're going to do what he wants. How can you claim to love someone and never do what they want? I love my wife, but if I never do what she wants, it's hard to make a case for the fact that I love her. Fortunately, I do. So love honors one another by, by caring about what someone else cares about. How can we claim to love God if we don't care about what he cares about? Doing what's right, loving people the way he does. So first of all, that's the first thing you need to know if you want to receive this peace. You have to learn what it means to love God, and you actually have to do what he says. Otherwise, you're never going to get this peace. It will always be out of your reach. But for those who do love God, there's a great promise in store here. So Jesus says in verse 25, All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus makes a distinction here between his peace and the world's peace. Notice he says, I give you my peace. Has anyone ever given you something that belonged to them for you to borrow and use? Has anyone ever let you borrow their really nice car? You know, if you have like a car from the 2010s, you know, this older thing, and someone lets you drive their 2023 car. You know, they let you borrow it while your car is broken down. It's like, whoa, I'm driving someone else's car, and this car is a lot nicer than mine. Like the same way you can drive a car that belongs to someone else that is nicer than yours, God's peace is nicer than ours. Our peace is this broken down little thing that barely starts most of the time. God's peace is nice. God's peace is perfect. So he said, I'm going to give you the keys to my peace. I'm going to let you drive it around as much as you want. It's yours. And I don't give it to you as the world gives. My peace is going to be different. It's a peace that cannot be taken away from you. And that's why you don't need to let your heart be troubled. It's why you don't need to be afraid. I read this online, and it's perfect because it's totally based off the Bible. It reads, the world says, follow your heart. Jesus says, follow me. The world says, be true to yourself. Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself. The world says, believe in yourself. Jesus says, believe in me. And the world says, live your truth. Jesus says, I am the truth. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. See, that is the difference between the world's advice and God's advice. God's, the world's advice is, well, trust in yourself and cross your fingers, hope it works out. God's advice is trust in me, believe in me. Even if you don't have confidence in yourself, that's okay. You don't have to believe in yourself. Believe in me. Believe in what I can do. Believe in what I have already done. So belief in God is what leads to peace. Peace comes from belief. Peace, or lack thereof, is always tied to belief. What you believe can cause you peace, or what you believe can cause you stress. Here's an example. Imagine if, in the fellowship hall afterwards, when we sit around and start eating bagels, I talked with some of you guys and said, yeah, did you hear about that escaped criminal in Sayville? The, the what? Yeah, you didn't hear about it? You know, the news hasn't really started covering it yet, but there's this dangerous criminal that escaped from jail that's uh, sneaking around Sayville and could be breaking into people's houses. You'd be like, oh my gosh. And then it's the game of telephone. You'd probably pass it on to someone else. And I could spread this story and cause everyone in this room that lives in Sayville a great deal of anxiety, even if it's not true. There is no escaped convict, by the way. But if I said that, I could stress all of you out just by getting you to believe it, even if it's not true. At that point, someone who does not exist is stressing you out. That is the power of belief. So what if we flip that around? What if you believe in someone that is real that causes you peace instead of causing you stress? So that is the power of belief. If you believe that there is a strong person that can protect you, if you believe that you have a good insurance policy, if you believe that you are prepared, that you are secure, that you have what you need, that belief will stop you from being stressed. Even in the cast of the holidays, if you know that you are ready, 
notice that the chaos does not shake your peace. So that is proof that peace cannot come from what is outside. It cannot come from circumstances. Because if you believe in circumstances, you're going to get stress. If you believe in God, you can have peace even if the circumstances do not change. God does not always take us out of trouble, but he will always put his peace into us. So we wish that God would take us, right, and take us out of the trouble. And, you know, take us out of all the chaos and the stress and the violence and put us somewhere over here. But he doesn't do that. Some, he can work all things together for good. He does miraculously deliver us, but he can't, it wouldn't be in our best interest for him to fix everything. If he just made life this utopia where all problems will gone, are gone, that will happen one day. But until it does, we need to stay in the trouble. We're, it, we're all in it together. No one gets a free pass of getting out of death and disease and difficulty. Everyone's going to experience it. So instead of taking us out of trouble, you know, taking us and putting somewhere else, God lets us stay in the trouble for a time, but he takes his peace and he puts it into us. I think that's a lot better. I'd say that a good day with, a bad day with God is better than a good day without him. I'd rather have a chaotic, stressful, terrible day at work and at home and, and maybe in the hospital with God, knowing that I can pray to him and talk to him, than have a great day that's all dependent upon circumstances where I don't believe in God and I don't know what's going to happen if I die and, and I have all this uncertainty and I'm just hoping that all my ducks stay in a row and that nothing falls apart. I'd rather be in chaos with God than be in peaceful circumstances without him. Peace starts on the inside, like we said. Everything starts with a thought, and then that thought becomes a pattern, and then that pattern becomes a habit, and then that habit becomes an action. So believing in God, trusting in him for peace, is something that starts on the inside, and it can flow to the outside. I've heard people say, let, the, say, let there be peace on earth, but let it start with me. It has to. Because if we try to affect peace from the outside going in, it's not going to work. The chain reaction needs to be from the inside out. And it makes sense because when Jesus was born, like we said, it was a time of great violence. It was a time where the Roman Empire was frustrating and persecuting like everyone. They were, was just, they were this violent, terrible government. And the people in Jesus' time wanted him, the Messiah, to take the Romans away to get rid of the Romans. Notice in the past that didn't work because if you read the Old Testament, God did, did give deliverance to the Israelites. They fought wars with other oppressive nations like the Philistines, the Canaanites. God delivered them from those people. So even when Israel had no enemies in sight, not a cloud in the sky, right? You know what they still managed to do? They still managed to mess it up because they didn't have belief and trust in God in their own hearts. When they had not an enemy that could take them down, they became their own worst enemy. They gave in to temptation and idolatry and pagan worship and terrible things, and they became their own enemy. So even if God removed all of our enemies, all of our problems, the chaos would still be in us. That disease would just be doing everything it can to get out, and it would create chaos again even if God removed all the external problems on the outside. We would give birth to it again and again and again. So until the peace is inside of us, until we have this unshakable belief of God inside of us, we're just going to keep spawning chaos, and it's never going to stop. So that is why peace has to start on the inside. You can't wait for everything to be peaceful on the outside and then be peaceful in here. When Wadsworth, the poet, was writing that poem the civil war was still going on. Notice when he said, God is not dead, he does not sleep. The wrong will fail and the right will prevail. The civil war was still going on. It didn't end yet, but he knew it was going to, and it did. And he knew that God was going to make sure that his people would prevail and that those who trust in him would see things work together for good and that everything would be made right, and it did. So belief takes the teeth out of the pains of life. It really does. How many of you guys have watched Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, that old, like, claymation movie? Remember the scene at the end where they need to get past that abominable snowman, like that giant bumble? That thing was scary. It still is a little bit. It's just unsettling. So they need to get past this giant abominable snowman, and you remember what they do? Yukon Yukon Cornelius, he, he drops a rock on his head, knocks him out, and then that little elf who wants to be a dentist takes all of his teeth out. Remember that? And then he wakes up, and he has, like, no teeth left. 
And he's like, he's nothing without his chompers. That's what the peace of God does to the stressful situations in our life. The stress is still there. There's still this giant abominable monster, but it's got no teeth anymore. That's what I've noticed the peace of God does. When you're at work, maybe tomorrow, and you have um, a manager yelling at you or criticizing you, you have uh, coworkers giving you a hard time, maybe a client or a patient or someone yelling at you, maybe over the phone, maybe in person, because you can't help them or you can't figure something out or you can't give them what they want. That external stress is still going to be there. We're always going to be dealing with stuff like this. But what the peace of God does, it takes the teeth out. It's like this person is yelling at you, it's like, nom, 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 nom. it's just like all gums. And yeah, they might be yelling at you, but when you believe in God, what's different now? What's changed? Well, even though you still have to deal with them, you can know deep inside and believe, even if they insult me with every word in the book right now, I don't believe what they say. I believe what this book says. God says that I am valuable, that I am worthy of love. Even if this person says, I'm dirt, I'm scum of the earth, I'm lower than dirt, I'm the dumbest person that, uh, that they've ever seen, there's still a God who loves me no matter what regardless of my IQ, regardless of my work proficiency. So whenever I'm in a situation at work where I just don't feel like I'm good enough, I remember that I don't need to be. He's good enough. He proved it on that cross, and he did that for me so that I never had to feel inadequate. When I'm not enough, that is. So when someone's yelling at me, that's how the teeth are just taken out of the situation. It's like, yes, this person is upset, and they're raising my blood pressure a little bit, but even though my body is maybe reacting to the stress, which our bodies do, my soul is peaceful. I don't have to believe what they say because I believe what he says. And even though it's hard for me to believe that this person is worthy of love, they are. And you see how, you know, the situation is still there, but the teeth are different. The Bible says that death has no victory, that the grave and death have no sting anymore. It's like a bee that has the stinger taken off. Imagine you were in a room full of bees, right? And you're like, oh my gosh, I'm allergic to bees. But someone said, oh, these are genetically modified bees that have no stingers. You know, we took all the stingers off of them. Wait, they have no stingers? No, no stingers. Can, can they bite me? Nope, they don't have teeth either. They don't have like pinchers or anything. That, wait, so all they can do is like fly around and bump into me? Yeah, they, these bees cannot sting you. Would you be afraid of a room full of bees? It might still be unsettling to have all these flying insects, but you wouldn't be afraid of being stung. And you wouldn't have to be. That's what it means to be a Christian. I still get stressed. I still deal with difficulty. But I'm not afraid. When I was driving home from Pennsylvania recently, you know, on the Belt Parkway, the Jersey Turnpike, you know, trying to get in the right lane with those tolls, it is very stressful. You know, my, um, my wife Amanda's like, normally, you know, you talk more. I'm in the car. I'm like, not now. I need to focus. So <laughs> I was very focused, but I wasn't afraid. I was focused because I didn't want to die. I'm like, eh, today doesn't seem like a good day. Then eh, tomorrow's not a good day either. <laughs> it's like I knew that if I made a mistake, something very bad could happen. But I wasn't afraid of dying. I wasn't necessarily afraid of getting in a car accident. I didn't want it to happen because I don't think anyone here does. But notice the fear is gone. Belief in God, knowing if I die right now, you know, if the worst case scenario happens, I know exactly where I'm going to be. I have no worries about that whatsoever. The external stress is still there, but so is the peace. I'm not afraid anymore. And that is what the peace of God does. It is better to have it on the inside. And if you don't know what it is you're believing in, if you're like, okay, I understand that peace comes from belief. I need to believe in God. Then just read your Bible a little bit more. Read what he says about you. Read what he says about life. Whenever there's a situation where we are stressed out, where we are in chaos and our peace is robbed, we are believing a lie instead of a truth. The truth is God loves us and we are worthy of love, no matter what anyone else says. Other people will say we're not, God says we are. It's like the thing I read before, the world says, but God says. You always have those two sides of the coin. You have the voice of the world and then you have the voice of truth. And you have to listen to what the voice of truth says instead There are Bible verses that tell us, like I said, that we are loved, that we are enough in God's eyes. Not because of what we've done, but because of what he's done. There are Bible verses that tell us there's always a way out. When you think you're in a dead-end situation where there's no way out, that's you talking. You said that. God didn't say that. 
Even if other people are telling you there's no way, he says there is a way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he has made a way out of every situation. That's part of what it means when he says he works all things together for good for those who love him. That even includes bad things. It says he will not tempt us beyond what we're able to bear. So if you're in a situation where you think the only way out is to lie or to sin or to do something immoral or dishonest, God's not saying that. You're saying that. We're stressed out because we think we're going to have to get our hands dirty and do something unethical. God says, now there's always a way out. I wouldn't put you in a situation like that. So whenever there is a lie that is stressing us out, that there's no way to succeed at this job, there is no way to pay the bills, there's no way to do the right thing, there's no way to beat a temptation, whenever we say all those things, we are stressed out because like believing there is a dangerous criminal criminal in the neighborhood, we are believing that those things are true, even though they are not. We are walking into every situation with a belief, expecting failure, expecting bad things to happen, believing the lie instead of the truth. And once again, that is the power of belief. But what if we did believe that God works all things together for good? What if we do believe that we are worthy of love no matter what anyone else says? What if we do believe that there is a way out of every temptation, that there is an answer to every problem, there is a solution to every conundrum? What if we believe that? Is it possible to believe these things and still be stressed out? I don't think so. It's very difficult. And this is how we can have peace on earth, right here, right now, before the chaos ends in the Middle East, before the chaos ends in this country, before the chaos ends in our lives, before the financial hardship stops, before the medical difficulties stop, before all these things go away, even while they are still present, we can have this peace that passes understanding, which is built on God and his promises. And that's another verse that we quoted today that I want to end with. It's in Philippians. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Chapter 4, starting in verse 6. Paul says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, hear that? Every situation. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of Jesus is a guard, a bouncer, standing at the door of our hearts and our minds, preventing the chaos from getting in. We want to see more peace on earth and more goodwill towards men. But even when the will of men towards one another is not good, even when our will is not good, God's will for us is always good. A Christian singer uh, wrote music years ago. His name was Wayne Watson, wrote these lyrics about that verse, about the peace that passes understanding. He says, The peace that passes understanding is a blessing that will never fade away. The peace that passes understanding is here to stay. And the peace that passes understanding never passes away. And that is a promise we can believe in. Let us pray. Jesus, thank you for giving us peace even when we can't understand. Thank you that this peace does not require us to understand. Peace does not come from understanding. Thank you, Lord, that your peace comes from believing. You made it so simple that just belief is enough to access the good things you have for us. Not just saying or doing, but really, really believing. Lord, you say in your word that Abram, one of your earlier followers, believed and you credit it to him as righteousness. Thank you that belief is all we need to be in right standing with you. Thank you that we don't need, don't need to jump through a bunch of hoops. We don't need to do a bunch of religious things. All we need to do is believe that you are who you said you are, that you came as a baby born of a virgin, that you lived and taught and died and rose again and did it all for us. Help us to believe that today. And if there's anyone in this room that is struggling to believe that, Lord, please meet with that person in their heart. They can come to you right where they are. They can say right now, yes, I want to believe in you. I want to receive this peace. I want to receive this salvation that's based on the works of God and not my own works. So if there's anyone in here who does not yet believe, in Jesus' name, I I thank you that you will receive them today in spite of anything they've done. 
You don't judge them. You're not angry at them. You want them to go to you because you love them. You love all of us. We are all loved in this room. I thank you so much for that. That just blows my mind, that that love is not based on anything we've done, that you do know what we've done and you love us anyway. So resting in that gives me such a measure of peace. Thank you for your peace that is felt in this room right now here, Lord, today, and that we can experience this anywhere we are. We pray all this in your name. Amen.